thank you so much for showing up on this night where I would be in pajamas on the sofa. <laughs> so thank you for coming out. It's an effort that I hope will be worth your time. I know for me, any time with Carol Ferris is a great treat. And always I learn so much about what I don't know about myself. And I think the great dream of my evening tonight with you was to give other people a chance to drop in on our conversation because we get into things that are so um, helpful for me in opening up what I don't really understand about darkness or difficulty. When I met you and you read my chart, I had never heard anyone describe astrology as you do. It gave me a philosophical opening to my darkness that I was really trying to avoid. And yet, you made it comfortable for me to see it and to work with it based on the timing of my chart when I saw you. And you are the woman that made me curious about the language of astrology because I realized it's a language that gives us so much to work with individually and collectively. So it is just a huge pleasure to have you with me as a co-pilot tonight. So Thanks, Carol Laura. Ferris. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. So I wanted to open tonight. Um, you're <clears throat> in your seventh decade of life. I am. And you told me that you've been curious about astrology since you were in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And so that means you probably spent lots of time with your chart and you probably know it inside and out. What I want to know is knowing what you now know in your 70s, looking at your chart, has it been a guide that has totally hit its points as you would have expected it to, understanding it at the level you do? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I love my language. I love the astrological language. And um, it grabbed me in 1968, and it hasn't really let go of me. Um, astrology, when you, when you go to an astrologer and you have your horoscope read, um, horo is hour and scope is map, a map of the hour. So a horoscope is a geography and a moment in a season. And we step in to time and space, and we begin to adapt ourselves to the larger environment. Um, we, we step into the solar system, and we step into the solar system on Earth, and we begin somewhere. So the simplest thing about astrology is that not all times are like all other times, and not all places are like all other places. So when I think about my introduction to astrology and the first time that I saw my chart, I think the first extraordinary thing for me about it was not anyone is like anyone else. It was such a, it was such a revelation to me that, it, that, that there was this idea that there was a, a, a field of possibility out of which something individual arose and that you could know it. And that how it arose for you wasn't how it arose for your spouse or your best friend or your child. My son was two at the time. So this is a long-winded way to answer your question. I, th I am who I am and astrology really helped me understand where I began and how to go on. What I see now um, and that I'm learning is that astrology, like any topology, so as some of you know, I'm very interested in the Enneagram now. I've always been very interested in Jung and Jungian typology. Um, most of you have probably had a chance to, um, if you're in the corporate world, to have Myers-Briggs. There are a lot of ways to describe the self. And then there is the field of all possibility. So what I have come to now in my seventh decade of looking at my own chart and watching my arc of development 
is that I'm both who I began as, that's inside me. You know, I have this corny phrase borrowed from the great Jungian James Hillman. He says, an acorn does not grow up to be a mule. <laughs> and, and so I, um, I'm in my oakness now, and, um, and it is absolutely tied to the pattern and the adaptation of my origin, which is deep inside me, but it doesn't limit me. It's a beginning. So I would say my relationship to my own understanding of my own life is that astrology has not only brought me deeper and deeper to this self that's the gift that I get, but that it's given me more flexibility. Because when you sit down with four or five people a day, five days a week for 50 years, <laughs> you get to hear a lot of really amazing stories about how other people live their life and live their stories and live their adaptation. And every horoscope has 360 degrees of space and time. And I've learned from every single story that's come to me. I, I won't be that story, but it gives me, in my own adaptation, more flexibility and more understanding as I get to meet the whole world, not just my world. And in your chart, I know you're Virgo sun. Yes. What is your moon? I have a Taurus moon. And your ascendant. I and I have Aquarius rising. So that's my next question. Okay. Is we often hear, pay attention to your sun, but don't ignore your rising and make sure you know your moon. And so help us all understand in very basic language, why are those three aspects of our chart emphasized often as the most important points? <clears throat> and then with your chart, how those two signs other than your Virgo have definitely told you your own story. So a map of the hour. And the primary element of the horoscope is light and dark. And um, I was thinking this again today. Um, the sun is four and a half billion tons of hydrogen and helium exploding per second. And that idea of this enormous, enormous force that creates um, stability in the system and is the heart of our system and is not only does it create orbital stability in the system, but on our planet it brings heat and light and, and we could say that it brings consciousness. So it's important to know where the sun is because it's when you step into the system, you are in a relationship with the burning heart of yourself and of the system and your relationship to it. The moon doesn't burn. And except for the Mesopotamians, most great mythologies and astrologies talk, say about the moon, she carries light. So the moon in the horoscope will tell an astrologer something about your relationship to what carries you? And of course, interpretively, that's motherness. So on a really, really simple level, the sun and the moon are the great father and the great mother. They're the great lights. And um, light is energy. It doesn't just move energy. Light, light is energy. It's yang energy. Pure, undifferentiated, potent creativity. And the dark is the form that gives the light somewhere to go. You need to know what your rising sign is because it's where the earth is turning towards. What's rising in your world at the moment that you step in and draw your first breath? What are you, what are you looking at? So one of my favorite ways to talk about the great lights and the rising sign as, as primary qualities um, comes from a very early Hellenistic tradition of astrology. So the, the Greeks um, inherited a very sophisticated conceptual framework, not only from the Mesopotamians, which is uh, Iraq and modern day Iraq and Iran, but it had traveled, astrology had traveled out of the Middle East to India, and it had traveled north all along northern Africa, and the Arab culture had made huge contributions to it. 
So that by the time Alexander the Great conquered the, the Mediterranean and the Hellenistic world began to develop, there was a very sophisticated but grecified point of view about not only astrology but about the horoscope. And so one of the ways that the Greeks talked about the horoscope and, and those three elements of the horoscope is um, this is the ship that you got to sail on the Sea of Life. They were sailors. And why get a ship? Why would you incarnate? Why, why sail? And so the sun in the horoscope is the purpose. Why sail this ship? Sun in Aries, sun in Cancer, sun in rising, sun setting, sun at the midheaven. Why get a ship? What's the purpose of it? The moon is how do you put provisions in the hold? How do you pay for the journey? How do you carry it? And the rising sign, the ascendant, was considered to be the helm of the ship. How do you steer? And what direction do you steer so that you can achieve your purpose and you can put provisions in the hold and afford to sail farther? And in your chart, have you felt that your moon and your ascendant have shown up for you in the way that you would have expected, looking at where they were placed in your story? I don't think I knew it right away. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, of, of coming to terms with my own nature. A Taurus moon, for, and those of you who are familiar with this language, I was talking today about, um, to um, a room full of astrologers about animal spirits. I've got very interested, very, very interested in that the names of the zodiac are not just psychological metaphors. <laughs> They're bodies. We're in a body. We're animals. We have imagination and we share locomotion and breath and appetite and a lot of other things with animals, but we have imagination. And um, so it's tempting to forget the animal body. So I would say in my animal body, the bull, there is something about a bull that the Spanish call carencia. And it is what the bullfight is built around. And it's what the bull dancing of the great Cretan ages. And it's what the Chinese and the Mesopotamians knew about a bull. That there is something about bulls that wants to take root. And that's what carencia means. It means heart root or heart place. So the bullfight brings the bull into a place the bull's never been. And He's looking for his carencia. He's looking for his safe spot where he'll take root. And he finds it. And that's when the fight starts, because if the torero and the picadors and the matadors can't pull him off his safe spot, he's very dangerous. So Taurus, the bull, as a psychological aspect, you know, you read popular things about how bulls are stubborn, but that isn't the half of it. It's that there is something in nature in late April and May in which nature is rooting itself like bulls do. And you want nature to take root. After Aries, the ram, after all of the energy has risen up to the sun, then you want everything to root back down in the earth. So. I have in my nature that quality, and because it's the moon, it's what I, what I need. It's my inner mother. She likes to have a profound relationship with the earth, with the rhythms of the seasons, with domesticity, with predictability. So you, you um, in an ideal world, of course, you want a mother who is devoted and stable and reliable. So in my Taurian nature, I would look at my chart and I would think, well, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a mother who wants to be down to earth and practical. But with my Aquarius ascendant, I'm a weirdo. And, um, and I always was, and I still am. And my Aquarius ascendant, the, where I was steering the ship was, wow. What else? What else is possible? What's, what's outside the system? What's on the other side of what's 
dependable and reliable and knowable. And so the reconciliation of the part of myself that was driving the ship to explore and innovate and be adventurous and risk and live in the moment and to love the moment, which I still do about astrology, your horoscope is the moment, was in conflict with the part of me that wanted stability, a big fat rock on my finger, um, a steady income, a roof over my head for my child. And it has taken into my seventh decade to figure out how to be a weirdo and stable at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got a great compliment from a, a wonderful client, probably when I was through making my worst mistakes as a beginning astrologer and beginning to really have confidence in the language. And he looked at me and he said, you're the most grounded woo-woo person I know. That's true. I would agree. Everyone's been saying the last few months have been heavy, you hard. Think? Yeah, like super demanding at a level that none of us can remember it being this, the high velocity of now. But coming off of several hard months where there's just been the fatigue of how do we keep going. And so what I was reading is that when Jupiter was in Scorpio and now is in Sagittarius, it's not gonna get easier, but we will have a desire to go through the conflict knowing there's a solution. So I think the whole timing of now is worth some of your reflection, uh, both through the horoscopic language, but also what you have come to understand with the dark and the light because it feels like ever since the election time, we've just been pushed at a level that's too much. And, and where does that come into the idea of the sky and the earth and, and how we're all feeling emotionally? And I, don't, I know I'm not alone. So I want a little bit of transcendence through the fear of all that we don't know, but that we've been tested up to this point and it's getting a lot more difficult because it's not letting up. That's how I would describe it. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently a question on someone else's mind. Um, so complicated question. We live in light and dark and, and in the abstract, the function of the dark is to force us to turn inward and come to terms with an interior. If you think about the dark as yin and yang. Humans don't like the dark. We don't like the dark. We want to transcend. And I remember after the election in dance class, you, I'm getting ready to dance and Laura says, have you got a silver lining for us? <laughs> I said, no, I don't. I said, silver lining thinking is what got us here in the first place. Now we have to really look at what is, not what we wish was. We have to look at what is. And so, I ha I, um, so one part of my answer to you about these days is that other human beings have lived in times like these. Just none of us has. Mm -hmm. If you're a student of history, and if whether you're an astrological nerd and you look at the great astrological cycles, which I do, and if any of you are interested in a very accessible book about these big cycles, the philosopher Richard Tarnas, who is the head of the Philosophy and Consciousness Program in, at the CIIS in San Francisco, has written a brilliant book called Cosmos and Psyche. And it is for students of history and for those of us who wonder how they do it before and will we do it again, or is there something else we could do? It's a, it's a, a useful resource. Other human beings have lived in times like this. So it is a contraction. Mm -hmm. Things expanded and things can't expand forever. And so we are in a contraction. And in that contraction, the, a lot of the expansion has been compressed or eliminated 
or um, tormented, we could say. So um, my, uh, the astrological phrase that I use is the planet Saturn, the mythology of Saturn, is that it is a force for creating structures of value and meaning through limitation. So Saturn isn't just the old dude who ate his children, although you, you have that feeling that the future is, uh, is uh, uh, in question because of the contraction, and it is. You know, Saturn defeated his own father and didn't believe that he himself was going to be defeated, and then Zeus came along. So we have about 4,000 years of patriarchal history that have to do with um, the creation of uh, a, a certain model of leadership that has to do with contraction, with making things manageable. In mythology and in astrology, the planet Pluto, or Hades, is um, a, an image, not just a metaphor, but our awareness that there is darkness, and not just the comforting darkness of rest and winter, which is one kind of darkness, but the darkness of deep loss, and that we're going somewhere, if we're going into the underworld, very few people come back from the underworld the way they went in. Hmm. So it isn't that the great, some of the great heroes and some of the great heroines, especially of the Western idea about the underworld, it isn't that they didn't come back, but they weren't who they were when they came back. We're in a passage now of Saturn and Pluto coming together, contraction and darkness, that other human beings have been through before. And so what I say to myself as I look at my own future and when I talk with you as, as my clients, what I say is, what kind of structures will you build to hold the darkness? So it's not just a metaphor. It's um, in the past what human beings have done to hold the darkness is make bombs, plutonium, is an ingredient in bombs. And the Saturn-Pluto square, it was the, asp the astrological aspect of the Manhattan Project. Saturn and Pluto in other relationships in history have, um, human beings have decided that how they're going to hold darkness is by making war, which is projecting their own darkness onto the enemy. As you know, I've been going to England this year to um, learn from the remarkable Martin Shaw, who to call him a storyteller isn't nearly as dignified or as, as important as his work. But um, I went to um, a lecture that he gave in America in 2017, not long after the election. And someone said to him, well, you know, well, what about this guy? And Shaw looked at all of us and he said, every story has an ogre. <laughs> and boy, it was like, that's right. Every story has an ogre. So as I contemplate it, it's not our ogre. That guy, those people, the other, it's really tempting to project our own inner inability to come to terms with our own darkness onto them, and they're happy to hold it. And see, this is where I feel like we could use some uh, information that may come through your language of astrology, because I actually feel like the fact that we're being forced into this dark time, whether it's personal or political or just the violence that has become so much a part of our um, normal life, I, I think the only way through it is through it. And so what, in it. and in it, yeah. and, and so what I feel has just been a personal experience in the evolution I mentioned with you helping me with darkness is to allow it to have a place at the table, knowing that that in its own way is moving it as opposed to denying it. Because with denial it becomes a storage within the subconscious. Um, so 
in the, in the language that you know, where do you go in your own outlook around the Saturn-Pluto configuration, and how long are we going to be in that so that we have a sense of the timing of this symbolic time? Not just symbolic. I mean, this is a symbolic language that describes a, a, collef a collective experience. Yeah, so what, what mm -hmm. does it look like as you see it? Two years. From now. Yeah, so 2020, is Perfect. when Saturn and Pluto come together. Jupiter will join also, so I'll make a little tiny detour in this conversation about your observation about Jupiter moving from Scorpio to Sagittarius. So Jupiter overthrew Saturn, and um, Jupiter was Zeus before he was Jupiter, so, you know, some of you have heard this from me. If you remember your Greek mythology, Zeus screwed everything that moved. And, um, and he couldn't stay home, and he was the first god to bear his own child. He's the first male to have his own child. He bore Athena from his head. So in Chinese medicine, Jupiter, Zeus, is liver energy. It's wood spring energy. It's growing energy. So Zeus, no matter how you type it, Zeus is a way of thinking about the, the incredible thrust of nature to grow and that that's who Zeus is. It's, it's, it's our collective historical imagination at work naming the forces of nature that we see. So a part of astrology, since not all times are like all other times, the follow-on of that is some times are better for some things than others. <laughs> so in that astrological language, Jupiter, Zeus, rules Sagittarius. So now that, that this energy out there and in our collective understanding and how we move collectively in light and dark, even though things are getting darker, we have an uptick of optimism and enthusiasm and growth. And both things are going on at the same time. The situation hasn't changed. And it's not going to worsen, but it's going to stay the way it is for maximum two years with a, some kind of coming to the peak in two years. So my own personal response of how to hold the darkness is to come to terms with my judgmentalness, my certainty that I'm not that, my, uh, my quickness, to separate myself from people because those are Saturnian judgments. They make me distinct. They give me a place to stand, but they also separate me. And the, the kind of distinctions that I make around darkness, I'm not that. I'm, I'm good. I'm light. I'm bringing illumination. I'm, I'm looking for transcendence. It isn't that I'm not looking for all of those things, and it, it's not just taking the high road. It's that they're that looking at things exactly the way they are. And in a way, if you think about the last two years, it's taken us two years to see exactly how things are. Totally good. And, and you know, here with Jupiter in Sagittarius, a hundred women were elected to the Congress. So it, and you know, the new, the, I don't know if any of you have seen the cover of the new New Yorker, but the cover of the New Yorker is all of these white guys standing at a cocktail party in their suits and the door is opening and women that are in full color are coming in the door. It's just a lovely, lovely graphic about what's happening. So in the middle of this contraction and this darkness where there is an attempt to maintain power and, and limit all of us even further, our job is, and I said this in 2017, is to not let our imagination be co-opted by someone else's language. And it isn't magical thinking, and it's not affirmations on the bathroom mirror. Mm -mm. That as we begin to really come to terms with this is really the way it is, where am I going to stand in relationship to it? Because I firmly believe, and this is, a, you know, the psychologists talk about this, and my, and my learning for it came from the I Ching. Hatred binds you to its object. 
And so from my perspective, if you look at our president, something's got a hold of him and he's not in control. And so the challenge for us, for all of us, seeing what is it, it is that's happening, which has happened before, is to not allow our imaginations to be co-opted so that as we see what else is possible, we make choices, and that includes choices that are followed by action, personal action, whether it's writing a check or marching or working at a precinct or um, linking arms or um, taking care of children and reassuring children, that there are things that we can do everyday simple things that we can do to deal with the ogre that is us taking our negative energy and our judgment off that, bringing it back to ourselves going, I did that, I own that. And in the space that gets created, we have more opportunities and more flexibility to have a different kind of life. And see, that to me is so fascinating because if we took away all of the distractions that people get D detoured by. It's sort of like comparative mindset. If, if you're paying attention to who else is running next to you on the track, then you just lost some time. You know, when you run track, it's like you don't care at what, you just want to feel your legs. Because if you're looking at either runner on either side, you've just lost a few seconds off your time. So in a way, I feel like what we're going through with the media right now is such a huge manipulation, but it's taking us away from our own game. We're, we're, we're losing our leg focus. So we have to get back to how to work with the darkness, how to work with the challenges, how to be able to navigate without wanting it to just go away. Or we need more women. All of that is, is great, but right now, this time, requires us to stay with where we are and what's going on, but not paying so much attention to the manipulation of the media. And I think that has a lot of hope in the story if you are willing to get comfortable with this darkness that is so represented by nature and is okay, but it's being sold as the end of the world. Yeah. Well... <clears throat> I have a slightly different take on hope that it's borrowed, it's not my own take. Um, there are some remarkable human beings that are working with darkness on all different levels, one of them being death. And our culture is very, very um, death averse, Pluto averse. So I have um, had the great good fortune of meeting um, people who are working with Stephen, Dr. Stephen Jenkinson, who some of you may be familiar with Jenkinson's work. He's a really extraordinary Canadian who um, is working. He worked primarily in trying to change palliative care, uh, concepts of palliative care for the dying, and um, has written a remarkable book called Die Wise, and has just written a new book on um, elder called Come of Age and talking about how important it is in our culture for the elders to step forward and step up. From his consideration and from his language, um, and when I went to see the documentary that the Canadian Film Board did of Jenkinson called Grief Walker, which you can get through Netflix, um, I was rock, absolutely rocked by a scene in which he has been invited to attend to the death of a three-year-old girl. She's doctors in a Canadian hospital are keeping her alive with IVs. And the family asked him and um, help the family and help the doctors because they're prolonging the child's suffering. And so he corners these young, white-suited doctors in a small room in the hospital, and he has a dry board. And on the dry board, he writes three words. He writes, hopeful, hopeless, hope-free. And he looks at them and he says, hope is the enemy of the present. Mm. And I saw that movie in a room full of therapists and, the, and it was like the wind ran through the room. Everybody went, ah, because it's un-American to not have hope. 
it isn't that I don't have hope, but I don't, I don't misplace it for the present. Yeah. And that where we have to work with is the present, that out of, of clarity with the present, and that's why the silver lining, that's, I, I was, it was really on my mind the day you asked me, is there a silver lining? Of course there's a silver lining. Look at Lori Joe's photographs. <laughs> of course there's a sun, of course there's light. It isn't all grim. But we are in a time in which um, we are in a contraction and um, it's all around us. It's pedophile priests. It's um, national socialism. It's Angela Merkel saying she's not going to run again. It's Venezuela. It's not just our country. And so if we know that we're in a period of contraction, and we know that contraction has to do with the elimination of what does not work, then we have to be candid with ourselves and not hang on to things that no longer work for us. And I think that's part of the work too. And that's exciting, but it challenges most people because it means that you're going to have to go to the discomforting places that you can't avoid, but there is such an interesting mindset to try to avoid. So again, I think there's, there's a lot of um, grounding that comes with knowing it can get rough but it isn't going to stay rough because the time changes. Yes. The cycles, they, they move forward. Yes. And maybe that's the acceptance of how to navigate now, but don't assume it will always be this way. It won't always be like this. And um, one of the great gifts of the storytelling classes that I'm going to is um, to make the acquaintance of a story called um, The Listener. And it's a story from the Seneca. And the Seneca feel that our culture needs this story now, and so they've released Shaw to tell this story more broadly in the world. And it, that's exactly what it's about. It's that, um, it's the responsibility of the elders to hold children in potential, in accomplishment and triumph, and in failure. And to know that there will be loss, and that you'll, you'll screw up, and you'll regret it. That's what all the great stories about. We just did the Parsifal myth, and you know the great knight comes to the magic moment where he has the chance to ask the question that will save the world, and he doesn't know what to say, so he leaves. And we all have that moment. We all have that moment in our process when we could have done something different, and we didn't. We weren't paying attention. We lacked the courage. We couldn't take that half step more. And that will be true, too. But it can't stop us. And so we have to take another step and another step. And it's, it's why uh, um, the stories that we tell ourselves, the collective imagination about how we're going to live together, we, we have to... Um, have the, not only to have the courage of our convictions and keep our imaginations open, and I really want to respond to the one place that you're talking about, about the messy place, because the messy, dark place is where creativity happens. <laughs> and and, and it's, it, you know, all of us know this moment where you, you go to bed and you're in despair, and in the middle of the night you wake up and say, that's it. And it's because there's nothing there's no thing. And so we have, to, we have to trust ourselves individually and trust ourselves collectively in this process that we'll take the next step and we'll take the next step. And sometimes we'll fail. And we'll fail badly. And there will be consequences. And it will hurt. And there will be death and there will be loss. And maybe we're more equipped for that because of the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke a little bit about the teenage age group now, um, and I wanted to talk about that because in the you often will talk about nature um, as the time of your life. Um, I think you said I'm in my summer, in my life I'm 56. You were telling me about where you believe you are in yeah. your cycle. So tell us a little bit about how to support the younger generation right now in a way that gives them the nature metaphor for 
carry on soldiers, you can do this. You know, I have clients in their 90s, and I have clients that are 12, 13, and 14, and when parents ask me if I'll do their child's chart, if they're 14, I always say to them, um, you have to be willing to not come and sit with your child, because I think we know who we are when we're 12, 13, and 14. It's not just that our hormones are kicking in, although that's a part of it, but we've had 14 years of Saturnian formation where we're in the presence of the larger culture, of what they say the rules are, of what our parents say, eat this, it's good for you, we tithe, this is what we value, this is who we vote for. And at 12, 13, and 14, which is the halfway point in the Saturn cycle, something in us says, no, I, I know, I know, and this is the structure I'm going to build. I'm not following your rules. And then you have 14 to 28, which is, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to live this life force and this sense of correctness that is internal and potent in the face of the larger culture? And so 14 to 21 and 21 to 28 is, can I do this? Will I do this? Will I be supported in this? Have I gone up against the rules so seriously that I'm back to square one? Will, will, am, am I going to see my way clear? So my experience of my clients who are 12, 13, and 14 is they, are n they see this situation very, very clearly. They do. They're not fooled by it. They're not, you know, it's, it's, it's teenagers in Eugene, Oregon, who have filed in, the, in federal court to stop ruining our future. It's the kids that are filing the lawsuits. Well, I think we saw that, too, with <clears throat> that beautiful show of young people in Washington. Oh, on, but, on, gun, to, on gun to control. I mean... But they're yeah. up against the force of what was um, created within yeah. their truth. And I think that's a different resistance that they will have to fight through in order to keep finding the light in the dark. But I do believe there's a, there's a way they see it that is much more in line with what we're dealing with today. Yeah. And there's a realism that has come through that view. Yeah. But it's not in harmony with the older generation. And I think that's also interesting, but yeah. worth noting, as we had talked about with age groups. Some of you in Portland may know about SAGE. Um, there's a, a really remarkable organization. And it's in Portland, Oregon isn't the only place this is happening. It's an organization of seniors. Um, I'm not going to remember the ac acronym correctly, but it's um, people are passionately interested in the GE of SAGE, Seniors hmm, for gener Generational Equity, are deeply concerned about how the, um, the generation in power, not just politically but economically, are hoovering up the future. And um, they're creating opportunities for um, elders who have ideas about how to empower adolescents and people in their 20s and early 30s, um, and creating projects, all, not just all over Portland, but all over the state. I think that kind of thing is, is abroad in the system. I mean, it's, it's I, you know, we're, we're lucky to live in Oregon. We're lucky to live in Portland. We really sure. are. And, yes. and an awful lot of really wonderful things start here. But um, I, I, I think that it's echoed in um, uh, the, the lawsuit that the kids in Eugene have filed, kids, people in their late adolescence and, and early 20s. And I think it's also that we're seeing inspiration. Well, I think about when Trump decided that America would pull out of the climate accords, and Jerry Brown said, well, we'll then we'll work with China. So I think that's the kind of thing that we can show um, that as elders, that we can make a place for our children and our grandchildren to step forward and have the opportunity to exercise power and to fail, and for it to be okay to fail, and then let, that we all take the next step. That didn't work, 
what will work, instead of do it this way because this is how we've always done it. And I think, I, I see a lot of that happening, and I, I actually think that's really a part of this time. You know, Jan Kala, Oregon has an 18-year-old mayor. Hmm. You know, and so um, I, I don't, I lived in Jan Kala, so I have a very good idea about what the, that population is like, and it says a lot to me that this boy has been elected mayor. It's hopeful. I like the it word is. hope in that way. I wanted to ask if you ever see a chart astrologically where you are frightened to tell the person what you see. Like, do any <laughs> charts ever just spell <laughs> bad? Like, you are in for karma nightmare. Or does, <gasps> does every chart... <laughs> <laughs> the astrologer's first lesson: keep a straight face. Yeah, I wonder. What, I mean, I wonder what you wow. do. About <laughs> it's a great question. Yes, I see it. You know, you you. Um, the process of 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 a typology of reading a story. And that's what a horoscope is. It's a story. It's got great characters in it. It's got a mom and a dad. It's got the moon and Saturn. It's got an optimist, Jupiter. It's got an ogre, Pluto. You know, so a story is arising from the field. So there is the person and the, how their story has arisen and how they've practiced that story. The consciousness with which they've practiced that story and the um, reactive, habitual, instinctual response that has also created that story. That story moves forward. The horoscope is not, um, it's not a suit. <laughs> you know, you're not born and it's like, I am this way and I'm always going to be this way. There was, there was a great cartoon back in the old Village Voice by the great cartoonist Jules Pfeiffer, and it's got a guy in a suit with a brief, briefcase and a hat. First panel, second panel, third panel, fourth panel, fifth, sixth, seventh panel. In the eighth panel, he's standing there and he says, I must maintain this rigid posture or all is lost. And I think that's how some people think, that somehow hor the, the astrology is a language of fate or determinative and doesn't have to do with an arc of evolution and development. So the first thing I always look at is where did the story start and how is it growing now? And what are the adaptations, and how have those adaptations brought you to this point? How have those adaptations served you? Because some of them do. And how have some of these adaptations created a difficult situation in which you can't imagine there's another way to act? And then there's the larger environment. So it's the acorn not turning growing up to be a mule, it's the acorn turning into the oak in the weather. So as an astrologer, you will see situations in which a person is sailing towards difficulty that is not of their own making. It's the time. And I can't tell you what a difference that that can make to know this is not an error of omission or commission. This is not your sin. This is you arriving at a time in which you are challenged and which something is actually bigger than you are. I'm not one of those astrologers or those philosophers who says, everything you get in your life, you created. <laughs> the world is a lot bigger than our individual creation. And an astrologer is looking at this bigger world as well as you in that world. And so sometimes I talk very candidly about, I had a client the other day and, uh, and they wanted to talk about work. And so I said, there's been a revolution in your workplace that was not of your making. And it's a challenge for you to adapt. And I could see it just like, oh, right. I didn't cause this, but I still have a responsibility to deal with the environment. Sometimes I will see that there is an inner arc of development in which um, a person has brought themselves or they're at a point in their development where there will be loss and failure. And I talk about that. 
I talk about that, how will you, if you knew that in your story, you are coming to a place where you're going to have to say goodbye to something that you love and that has made you who you are and that has given you a ground to stand on and that its time and usefulness have come to an end. And that's different than, oh my God. So the job of the astrologer is to work with the language in a real way and to make a distinction about what is yours and where I also talk about where it's great, you know? It's like rock and roll, you know? This, to really take advantage of this time and grow something or take a risk or, or imagine something different for yourself. And, and, um, and I'm very candid about this is going to be hard. And... It's been hard before. You know what this is like. Let's look at the last time you found yourself in this situation. What decision did you make then? Would you make that same decision again? Because it's the same set of circumstances. It's 10 years later. It's 12 years later. What did you do then? Did that work for you? Maybe it will work again. Do you ever see couples where you think, this is not good, based on their charts? <laughs> Like, two signs that should not be together. Like, does that happen in working with couples? I'll, I'll begin with my belief. Anybody can be with anybody else. Okay. It's just how hard do you want to work? And you can, you can see in that chart that this is going to be way harder than if you were with a Libra or, okay, or the, a particular Libra whose chart looks like yeah. a way, or I'm saying yeah. Libra, I'm making that up. Um, the, <laughs> um, the scales, balance. It's, of, of course it's one of the things that people come to talk to an astrologer about because love is, love is the answer. <laughs> um, it, because love is so much a part of everything that we do. And um, especially when we fall in love or fall in lust, and sometimes they're the same thing, we mistake it for partnership. And I talk with people a lot about the difference between love and partnership. And the horoscope makes a very careful distinction between those two things. There's a place where we're, where we're playing, where we're dating, where we're falling. And um, it's delicious sometimes and terrifying sometimes, but it's not partnership. Partnership is an agreement. And in the horoscope, the fifth house is where we fall deeply in love. If you fall in love and you're having sex, the chances are pretty good there will be a baby. If you fall in love, the chances are pretty good it will be a friendship. If you fall in love, the chances are very good it will produce art. It's where the fruits of our loving labors occur. It's the geography of the productive heart. But that's different than partnership. Yeah. And that's where I work. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yay. Thank you. Yes. Great conversation. To be continued. To be continued.